You are interested in the unknown, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. We are gathered here as advisors, as scientists. The kind of place we expect a ghost to like to wander. Hey, we don't know where we're going to die, baby. I'll help you. I'm something of a witch. Welcome to Mission Spooky. I'm your fantastic host, JC. With me today, as per usual, the queen of everything herself, Kiki, and our local cryptic enthusiast, Cord. How you guys doing today? Yep. Death shall come on swift wings to him that touches the tomb of the king. Well, those were very unenthused answers, and I kind of was hoping for better from both of you. Um, Seriously? Like, that was... It was very dark. It was real weird. I don't know. It wasn't like an answer to my actual question. So, yeah, I was expecting (laughs) better. (laughs) I asked, how are you doing? And you said death is coming on swift wings. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good. It goes perfectly with the topic for today. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean it sounds good. (laughs) I'm not arguing that. (laughs) I did not write it. I did not write it, but you'll find out where it came from. Hey, you guys want to hear a really weird ass story that just happened like recently? No. Sure you do. Next next thing. Let's go. (laughs) It involves possibly a ghost. (laughs) Oh, well, I guess I'm slightly more interested. (laughs) Right. (laughs) It's okay. I'm taking it. My sister, who doesn't live very far from here, by the way, she's been getting garbage cans delivered to her house that are from a different company that she currently has. So this has happened like twice, I think now. So she, she finally calls the company. She's like, you need to come get these things. I don't know why they keep delivering them to this house. And the girl on the other line says, we're so sorry. We're not exactly sure how they're getting delivered to your home either. Because when we went back to trace it and find out who ordered them, the woman is dead. Of course, my sister's like, what? And they're like, yeah, um, this is the second time it's happened. The second time it's been called into our office. And different people have spoken to the person. But when we traced back the call and the person, they're dead. So we're going to come pick up the trash cans. (laughs) (laughs) And we've made a note of it in the office. And we would also just like to point out that um, it is sort of weird that you live across the street from a cemetery. And any of you who are watching TikTok videos from us, I actually had that on Halloween. I showed you that she lives across the street from the cemetery. So that, that is 100% true. And she's just like baffled because it's very possible that her street address and number, it's been confused before because there's another place. The thing is that it's very difficult to, to deliver anything directly to her home because she has a P.O. box. There is no mail delivery directly to houses in this area. Everybody has to go to the post office to pick up their mail. So uh, it's just really weird. It's, it's very it's a very strange situation. So she's kind of keeping her fingers crossed that it doesn't happen again, as well as the garbage people who, oddly enough, because she, well, she's far enough away, she has a different service than we do. The The service that we chose to use in this area is actually the service who's having the problem with the dead person calling them. <laughs> so I'm just like, oh, man, sorry, guys. <laughs> it's really that's really fucked up. But anyway, there you go. Little ghost story. Maybe. I mean, I, I guess it's interesting. Very odd anyway. Um, it kind of reminds me of, um, and, and uh, here we go, an episode of Ghost Story Guys where Brandon was talking about this sort of thing happening with cops getting called out to different locations or taxis being called out to pick up people who were dead. And they're just like, no, I got the phone call from this house. Like, what the fuck? And they're like, oh, yeah, sorry about that. Grandmom's calling for a taxi again. <laughs> It's just, I want to leave. All right, I wanted to go out. I'm stuck in this place. <laughs> Could you imagine, because like, 
you know, one of the reasons people say hauntings are, are a thing is because of unfinished tasks. And what if there's some old guy that used to live at that house and he's like, all I got to do is get an extra pickup of uh, trash. And then right before he was going to call, he had a heart attack or some shit. And that's why he keeps calling or she, I don't know, the ghost keeps calling to to have the trash. They're trying to finish their their last task on their well, daily chore list. She's lived there for a really long time now. And they knew a little bit about the house and uh, the kids when they were growing up there. I mean, they're like in their teenagers and like early teens at this point. But they were growing up in that house. And they were little. They used to tell her that they thought they saw a guy in the house. That there was the spirit who just kind of like hung out in the hallway watching them sometimes. There's never been any feeling there at all as though there's there was a female presence. I've been in that house like a bajillion times and I personally never felt anything at all, really. It's always felt pretty, I don't know, like normal. I do not disbelieve the kids when they said that. However, they haven't felt anything in a very long time. But I do think it's funny that she does have to clean the house out. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe the guy left and, the, and his wife is back and she's like, you need to get your ass moving and get this fucking place cleaned up. <laughs> Here's a couple more trash bins for you. I'm trying to help. Helpful ghosts. Right? Helpful ghosts. Right before we came on, um, I was looking at Twitter because I got a, like, a little thing about how Greg Newkirk was saying something about how sometimes paranormal investigators take themselves too seriously. Like we're seriously just kind of hunting for invisible things, whether they be cryptids or other. Yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't think we take ourselves too seriously at all. I, you know what? Anyway. <laughs> you take that fucking back right now because I take myself incredibly seriously. Everything I do is done with the utmost <laughs> expertise, okay? Because it's what I fucking do and I'm an expert on everything. Shut your freaking mouth, okay? God damn it. Fucking slander me. <laughs> 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 I got cord laughing. I'm happy now. Aye, aye, aye. I I don't even have a response to that. Good. Thanks. Yeah. It's, that was that was hysterical. You're welcome. I'm glad I could help. Yeah, and then somebody said something about I listened to that podcast, blah blah blah. And then John Tenney was like, please do DM me the name of the podcast because he wanted to listen. And I was kind of like, hmm. I'm a podcast pretending that I don't care which other podcaster was, but I do. And I really want to know who was it, who was it so I can listen to them and make fun of them. And I'm just kidding. But, um, but I'm not really, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We take the work seriously. If there is, especially this particular episode, I did a fuck ton of work for you guys. Yeah, if there's one thing I can say is I take this work very you know seriously. What? I, know I work my it. butt off. <laughs> you actually broke up while you were trying to say that. So Good. at least on my end, <laughs> and that was hysterical. <laughs> You're like, if I take it, I work my off. <laughs> nice. Which brings me to saying thank you, thank you, thank you so much for you guys currently listening newcomers welcome people who have listening to us for a while thank you so much for sticking with us it's been two years we are doing great i just got an announcement from good pods i already put it on instagram by the time this airs it's gonna be days old but you love us you really love us we are now number six in the indie true crime podcasts of good pods i don't know why um i guess we do kind of talk about true crime <laughs> on here a little tiny bit uh but we're also number 59 in indie podcasts alone top 100 and <clears throat> giggity number 69 for all time podcast <laughs> indie or otherwise number 69 i'll take noise i love it i was really hoping that one time well, at least one time we would get to be 69 nice I'm excited. Nice. I mean, Cord and I are 69ing. If you are, that is a Guinness Book of World Record like achievement. Why? Because I know that you're not in the same house. <laughs> so. oh, fair. Good point. <laughs> I was like, how's that Guinness Book of World? Oh, yeah, because distance. 
<laughs> I, would, I would do it. I was ready to fight. <laughs> uh, and we're not that far away. No. But still, far enough away that that would definitely be like, a, you know, a Guinness Book of record. Oh, man. All right. So I promised you guys, listeners, not, not the two of you. I don't promise you guys anything. I promised the listeners that I would do a mummy episode and I was hoping to have it done for October. Shit happened. We had a, a death in our close friends circle. Very unfortunate. And I've been working from home, single parent for just a little while. And before that, it was kind of stressful. So I think by the time this airs, we're going to be like a week behind. And I'm sorry. It's been a little bit rough, but we're okay. And I'm able to bring you mummies. It's in November, but you know what? I say, some people say 31 days of Halloween. I say 62 days of Halloween. You know, let's just, let's just keep, actually keep it creepy all 365 days. Right? Am I right? Yeah. 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 So. Mm Mm-hmm. Keep it spooky. We're going to take a quick break here for a sponsor. And when we get back, we're going to talk about the curse of King Totankhamun. I'm Dawn. And I'm Cole. And Scottish Murders is a true crime podcast dedicated to people from or living in Scotland. Just like anywhere else in the world, these murders can be truly horrific and shocking, and we want to shine more light upon them. Join us every two weeks on Scottish Murders, where we'll bring you cases both solved and unsolved, giving you an insight into the other side of Bonnie Scotland. Find us wherever you stream your podcasts, as well as on social media. Join Join us there. there. Bye! Hey, Spookster Squad. If you haven't heard about Anchor yet, then maybe you've been whisked away by fairy folk. Anyway, it's the easiest way to make a podcast, and it's how we're making ours right now. First, it's free, which is great for us, because who doesn't like free? There's creation tools that allow us to record and edit our podcast right from our computer or phone. And that's super helpful, especially if we're doing interviews at haunted locations. Anchor distributes our podcast for us, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and all other streaming services. As a mother of a mini Viking, things can get quite hectic, and JC, well, he doesn't do tech, or research, or editing. So Anchor really makes getting this podcast out super simple. Anchor allows us to make money from this podcast with no minimum listenership. With Anchor, I can record personalized adverts, like this one, and they will help match us with other sponsors as our podcast grows. And thanks to listeners like you, it has. Basically, it's everything we need to make a podcast in one place. It even tells us what country and region our listeners are from, and that has inspired us to create bonus episodes just for you guys. So, if you're ready to share your adventures with the world, escape the fairy realm and go download the free Anchor app, or go to Anchor FM to get started. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Oh, was I supposed to? I don't care. Oh, okay. Well, then welcome back. After this airs, because we're going to be doing at the end of the month, we had said we're going to start doing these fun things with JC, where we kind of um, ask him questions about previous episodes. We already recorded that, and that'll be airing at the end of the month on Patreon only. You're going to get that at the... It's going to be the $3 level because we're adding something else. We'll talk about that in the C section of this program later, but we're going to be adding something to Patreon level one for you guys. So the, the JC specials are going to be level uh, two, which is the $3 level. In this episode, however, I thought it'd be fun to get into my wheelhouse and talk about some ancient history, but also get specifically into Egyptian curses, namely the curse of King Tut's tomb. And just for emphasis, it's her wheelhouse because she was around when this happened. Oh, my God. I like I like the fact that you consistently make fun of my age. It's perfect. You're welcome. Glad I'm I could not assist. Offended. I'm not offended. <laughs> well, I was hoping that you would be, but. Nope. <laughs> I'm old as fuck and my knee hurts. <laughs> my knees hurt, too. Oh. <gasps> yeah, I bet. I've heard. Yeah, gotta make money somehow. This podcast ain't doing it. 
So as with pretty much everything we talk about here, the history of the people involved and what was happening in the world around them is important, especially to how this story plays out. So first of all, guys, what do each of you know about specifically King Tut's curse? Um, Cord, I'll let you go first, because obviously I'm going to have more information. So... As I hear a keyboard going off in the background, right? <laughs> uh, I know that it's about King Tutankhamen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that is correct. I did it. I'm the best. <laughs> You're ahead of JC right now. Congratulations. Um, I know that it was a curse on his tomb. Was it? Yeah. Deception check. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Let's do this. I know what, what my uh, save DC is. Oh. oh, fuck. I love. I absolutely. <laughs> Here we go. Nope. <laughs> Hashtag sponsor us cracking dice because, dude, I think I own almost every set now. It's kind of sick. Got the new one. Flaming Pumpkin or Ichabod's Fright. Nat 20. Suck it, bitch. Um, You're old. Can I just go back to that? I'm scared. I don't know what else to say. Okay. Oh my God. Uh, okay. You'll learn something today then. Yes. Because I will exciting? be paying attention. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because you're going to be tested on this later, JC. Oh God. It's just like school again. It is. It is. Only it's worse because I'm the teacher. JC and I had covered execration spells or texts from ancient Egypt. And I believe it's Ghost 101 episode 19. I thought it was the Shadow People one. I... I think I got more into it in the Shadow People one because that's episode 20. So oh, there's, that's there's true. Two, yeah. There's like two that we kind of graze over. And well, and then well, one we graze over and the other one we actually like go into it. But briefly, obviously go back and listen to them if you haven't. But briefly, the way those worked was that a list of enemy names was written on a tablet or a piece of pottery. And then that was smashed. And then that was buried. And this was considered a form of sympathetic or imitative magic. The Greeks, the Romans, the Arab nations all saw Egypt as a land of magic and mystery long before Europeans ever set foot there. And we have quite a few examples of cursed stories to prove that. Ronald Fritz wrote Egyptomania, a history of fascination, obsession, and fantasy. He's a professor at Athens State University in Alabama, and he goes into this in his book. So I suggest reading his book for further information. That came out in 2016. For those of you thinking, though, man, what the heck does Egyptian curses have to do with Pennsylvania? That's, that's something that's really far, far away from Pennsylvania. No, Egypt's right over there. I can, I can get there in like three minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, guess what, guys? Two things then. Uh, one, there is an Egypt, Pennsylvania. <laughs> that is <Nice>. really close. <laughs> There's a really good bread place there, too. A, ba- a bread place. There's a good bakery, but bread is like their thing. Good bread place. That's a bread place. That would be Egypt Star Bakery, BT it Dubs. Is, uh, yes. Shannon and I are big supporters of them. I love that place. Yeah. Absolutely. So, number one, yes, we have Egypt, Egypt Star Bakery. Hashtag eat local. Secondly, you're wrong again, because as a matter of fact, we hold what is arguably the first written mummy slash curse slash ghost story, and it is found in a book housed in the Althmar Library of Chemical History at the Science History Institute right here in Philadelphia. Interesting. Yeah. This book is written in 1699 by Frenchman Louis Penacher, and the book is called The Treaty of Embalming According to the Ancients and the Modern, with a description of some balsamic and fragrant compositions. Like, that's the whole title. Uh, it's also written in French, and so I'm not... I, the the whole balsamic and fragrant, I'm like, balsamic? I'm not exactly sure if that's the correct translation. I'm thinking it probably should be with a description of some balms and fragrant composition. But uh, Google Translate is not always 100% correct. So my, my French is not at all good, okay? It is muy terrible. <laughs> and my Spanish is fine. <laughs> no me gusta francés. So here is the story that's written, 1699. A man is trying to smuggle two mummies by boat from Egypt to Poland. The smuggler pays the sailors off to sneak the mummies onto the boat. 
He then befriends a priest traveling home from Jerusalem. Once off the coast, a furious tempest arises. The priest tells the smuggler that he sees obstacles in the way of the ship completing its safe journey. He sees the smuggler being harassed by two ghosts. The smuggler thinks this is utter nonsense, but a second tempest comes, even more dangerous than the first. The priest says that the two ghosts appeared to him as a man and a woman, and that they were dressed as mummies. The smuggler is now convinced that his mummies are cursed, and he throws them overboard. <laughs> Problem solved. Oops, my bad, guys. Let's feed you to the ocean. See ya. <laughs> right. Yeah. Have fun hunting them fishies. There are many other short stories that are published before King Tut's discovery. And I'm going to get into those in a moment. But I wanted to point out that they are published also after the discovery of the first mummies, which are mostly female. And this concept develops that because most of these expeditions are led by men, these famous women, powerful women, are being reduced to mere objects to be ogled. Their treasures are being stolen. Unwrapping them becomes a metaphor for rape. And Jasmine Day is an Egyptologist and cultural anthropologist, and she wrote a book that talks about this very thing called The Mummy's Curse, Mummy Mania in the English-Speaking World. That came out in 2006. So if you want to hear a little bit more about how women specifically were, were seeing this play out, it's a good book. These are the stories that predate King, it should be Tunt Ankh Amun, but I'm just going to say Tut Uncommon because, or Tut, because that's, I'm an American and I suck. Anyway, these guys predate the curse, and I will provide links to these probably on the website blog, because it's a little bit easier, and most of them are public domain and have free versions to read, so I'm going to try to link those free versions if you want to read them, because I did go through and read almost all of these. And I'm going to save one of the best short stories for last, because again, it has a connection to Pennsylvania. The first one is called The Curse of Varsartus, and it's published in 1889 by Ava Henry, and this came out in the Belgravia magazine, or Belgravia. It's about finding a female mummy, sending her to London, and starting a curse, which ends badly for most of the people in the story. So that's a cla- that's like the classic, don't mess around with women. Mm-hmm. There's a really kind of a sweet one. It's called The Mummy's Foot from 1890 by uh, a French author, Theophile Gautier. And it tells the story of Princess Hermonthus, which I thought was very clever because Hermonthus is actually an ancient Egyptian city. The modern name is Armont or Ermont, depending on how you want to say it. So clever, you know, he took the name directly from ancient Egypt, but it's not an actual princess. In the story, the guy goes and buys this foot from an antiques market, and he uses it as a paperweight. In the night... He is awakened by Princess Hermonthus herself, who comes back looking for her foot. Now, in this one, he is not a dickhead. And there's a very happy ending. I'm not going to get into it if you want to read the story, because it's really short. But it's, I guess it's very sweet. And it's basically about, I would say it's like taking it like the, from the perspective of someone who didn't really mean to do anything wrong, tries to put the wrong right, and then kind of winds up getting something very cool out of it in the end the other foot (laughs) no (laughs) no that would be a dickhead move oh i i want the other one too bitch chop chop (laughs) yeah sure why not gotta have the collection right guano bowls collect a whole set (laughs) yeah okay there we go okay so this one is a connection to pennsylvania It's a short story written in 1869 called Lost in the Pyramid by Louisa May Alcott, who's born in Germantown, Pennsylvania, which is not very far from where we are right now. And most of you should know Louisa May Alcott because she wrote Little Women, guys, right? I don't know how to read. We've talked about this many times. (laughs) I was just going to say, well, JC, yeah, but JC, you've seen the movie, right? Come on, Little Women, right? Yeah. Please. Yes, I have seen that movie. I'm not a sexist. That would be bad. Watch that movie. Sure. God, so bad. Is that the one with Julia Andrews? No. Then I don't know. Are you talking about The Sound of Music? No. Because that's Julia Andrews. 
Oh, my God. Oh, what about, you know what? It's Julia Roberts I'm thinking of. Oh, boy. No, that's pretty woman, not little women. <laughs> ah, well, you know, I'm getting there. Um, Closer. Oh, my God. Nah, that's that's going to be my last guess. Yeah, yeah. Just let's move on. <laughs> I read this one. Interesting story <laughs> and very, very dark. I would like to point out that the female character's name in this book is Evelyn. And it made me wonder. I didn't look it up, but it made me wonder if the mummy movie, like the new, the, the good ones with Brandon Fraser, that they were paying homage to this story by naming the female character Evelyn or, e you know, Evie. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's pretty fucking cool if that's what they did. Because this one I had not actually read until like I had to do this podcast episode. And I was like, oh, shit, I never read this. Anyway, the bridegroom gets himself stuck in a very bad situation getting lost in, in a pyramid and he and another man have to burn a mummy sorceress to save their lives it's a little complicated just trust me read the book it makes or read the short story it makes sense unfortunately though his friend steals a box that the mummy is holding and it has these red seeds in it of course the red seeds are grown and the story does not end well for anyone it's a very morbid story oh yeah, it's very gothic. Ew. The last one, as far as ones that definitely are about mummies' curses, I can't not mention The Jewel of the Seven Stars from 1903 because it's written by Bram Stoker. Ew. Yeah, a lot of people forget about these other stories that he wrote that were very popular. This is a first-person account of a young man who's pulled into an archaeologist's plot to revive Queen Terra who is an ancient Egyptian mummy. Of course, again, it doesn't end well for anyone, <laughs> which seems to be the prevailing theme of most of these stories. Yeah. Except for the one, except for the one the Frenchman wrote, because he was like, oh, it's going to have a happy ending. And by the way, we interviewed an ancestor of Brahms, Shanna Stoker, in episode 61. So if you've not given that a listen, please go give it a listen. Yeah, it was rad as hell. It was rad it as It was hell. fun to listen to. They, I mean, they made fun of me even though I wasn't there. So good job. Wait. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> did we? I don't even remember. Oh, yes. yeah, we did. <laughs> we make fun of him so much that it's like hard to tell anymore. Like, are we are you here when we're doing it? Are you not? I don't know. Yeah, it definitely doesn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> that time was special because we were making fun of him specifically for not being there, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was lame and he had some work. <laughs> God, whatever. I know. Needing money. Well, you Such know. Bullshit. Who needs that? <laughs> uh, I think all of us. Unfortunately, we can't barter with seeds. I mean, I can get off kind of on my good looks, but it's, it's only going to get me so far. And I have a certain standard of living. Okay. <laughs> Not in a cardboard box down on Fifth Street is what you're saying. <laughs> wow. Rude, but also true, I guess. <laughs> Same. I mean, you know. Uh, hey, side trivia. Bram Stoker also wrote Lair of the White Worm, and some of you may recognize that as a 1988 cult classic horror film starring Hugh Grant and Amanda Donahoe. And it's loosely based off of the story and the movie. Is. The movie is really fucking weird, but you want to see an extremely young Hugh Grant, go for it. Side side trivia. Amanda Donahoe, man, she was 16 years old when she was living with Adam Ant. And, and oh, according to Adam Ant, she apparently stepped in to defend himself against a physical attack at one point when he was recording a live performance on Top of the Pops. And this whole thing happened backstage with a band called 4B2, which was supposedly skinheads. And uh, I'm not even going to get into that part of it because it also has to do with Jimmy Lydon, who's Johnny Lydon's brother. Anyway, <laughs> she appears in like a whole bunch of music videos, including Ant Music and Stand and Deliver. Stand and Deliver being the name of Adam's book, which he tells this story about how she physically defended him. And that was your 1980s pop trivia for this episode. I feel like I kind of want to do this for every episode now. You do you, kiddo. I'm going to squeeze <laughs> 80s pop trivia in, in here all the time. If I can make Pennsylvania happen with the mummy's curse, I'm fucking do it. Lastly, I just want to mention another short story from 1903. It's called The Mysterious Mummy. It's by Arthur Henry Sarsfield Ward, better known as Sax Romer, much better 
pen name. Holy God. And he wrote all of the, um, or basically is the creator of Dr. Fu Manchu. Anybody? Dr. Fu Manchu? No. Nope. Nope. Okay. Nope. It's a heist story. And I wanted to add it because it's kind of an interesting concept of the mummy coming to life, quote unquote, coming to life to aid in a heist. <laughs> and it, it's a charming story. I don't want to spoil it. It's one of those. It's very short. Again, like just a couple pages. So I'll add that in there too for funsies. So while all these stories, though, are being written before King Tut, there's also all sorts of troubling things going on with real mummies, which begins after the Napoleonic expedition starting in 1798. European aristocrats and some royalty are purchasing mummies to unwrap them at private parties. Can you imagine? Like, that's that's your party. Welcome to my unboxing video, guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Only slightly fucked up. Yeah. Like, we purchased a dead person so that we can unwrap it in front of everybody and then go have dinner. Or have dinner, and then maybe you're unwrapping it with drinks. I'm thinking that's probably the way it was. That makes more sense. A little aperitif and some dead bodies. Anybody? <laughs> I mean, it sounds like a great night for me, but, you know. And, of course, there's corpse medicine, which was running strong in the 16th century onward. This is a whole other possible historical side mission that we could present. But I want you guys to remember this, that the 16th century physician, Paracelsus, suggested that when a person was killed suddenly, that his vital spirits would burst forth to the circumference of the bone and was therefore suggesting that a person's spirit could stay trapped within the bone and thus we should eat it to benefit from its power. Sounds legit. Let's start eating people's bones. But please, please just keep burning the witches. Uh, <laughs> Problem. They were cannibals. I mean, actual cannibalism. Eating dead people. And this was what he had said about a hanged man. Anyway, yeah, that's a whole other, that is literally a whole other episode. Wait, we've got all the fucked up shit that happened just in like the 1500s to just the 19, early 19th century is like fucked. People were weird. I mean, they say we're weird now. No, no, I'm not eating corpses. Uh, I was going to say, we're still kind of weird. That's, that's some change. Thank God in a different kind of way. I mean, at least the weirdos now are like, here, smell this lavender. It's going to cure AIDS. But, you know. It's a little less exhausting than eating dead people to me, I guess. Still terrible and untrue. However, there were plenty of people very upset over what was over what most rational people would deem as desecrating the dead. Uh, yep. And uh, some of those folks, well, I just mentioned them because they wrote stories like the ones above. And now that you have a decent grasp of what's kind of going on in the world around the great archaeologist Howard Carter, let's begin what I like to call countdown to the curse Ooh. we begin with 17 year old london born howard carter he arrived in egypt as an artist for egyptologist percy newberry i would like to note that carter's father was an artist and that is where he got his artistic talent from apparently over the years carter worked with many experienced archaeologists and egyptologists such as flinders petrie who's uh, like the father of um yep good job Yep. Thanks. I'm an archaeologist, by the way. <laughs> Good job. You did it. Yep. Systemic methodology. <laughs> that was what I'm like, system, system of a down. No, nope, that's not right. Uh, so systemic archaeology. And then also the preservation of artifacts was a huge deal for, for Petrie. So that's pretty cool. He also worked with Edward Neville. Enter the American, though, Theodore Davis. He hired Carter as an excavation supervisor. So basically, Davis had the money to fund the digs, but he needed someone like Carter to oversee everything. This partnership is pretty stable, and they record many important finds, including Tutmosis IV's tomb. This relationship is actually extremely important down the road. But first, we have the French incident. And this, guys, is why I love history and talking about people so much. Because if all of these things didn't happen in the order in which they did, it's very, very possible that it wouldn't have been Howard Carter at all that was involved in finding King Tut's tomb. Carter gets transferred to Saqqara, 
where he is working for the Egyptian government as the Inspector General of Monuments of Upper Egypt. One day, a group of French tourists wanted to go into the burial vaults of the sacred bulls without tickets. Oh, that's, you know, that's not nice. I try not to shit on the French people too much, but that's kind of, that's kind of shitty. Well, the Egyptian guard refused to let them in. Uh, obviously. The French, who were drunk, got aggressive and pushed the guard. Aye, aye, aye. In his defense, the guard pushed back. This, of course, makes them very angry, and they get all carony and decide they're going to file a complaint. They want to speak to the manager. Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. Unfortunately for the Egyptian guard, this is like the top of the colonial era. So it's unheard of that an Egyptian worker would push a French man without any consequences. The incident creates a political problem. The head of the antiquities service, who was French, he asked Carter to have the guard apologize to the French. And what do you think our boy said? Nah, fuck off. Get fucked. I hope that's the exact like rocks, quote. Nerd. God, I wish it was. I would be so... I mean, Howard Carter is cool, but I would love to have just been in the fly or a mosquito on the tour. <laughs> uh, you know, to have him say, get fucked. And would you like me to say it to you in French? Yeah, he refuses. He absolutely refuses to have any of the guards apologize because that behavior from the French was unwarranted. And he gets transferred elsewhere. So he kind of loses his position. And in doing so, he then just resigns completely from working for the Egyptian government. And he takes on being a full-time artist for just over a year. Carter makes his comeback, though. Kind of. Enter the man. The legend. George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert. That's... I know. <laughs> that's a name. <laughs> Holy shit. Can you say it again for me, please? George Edward Stanhope Molyneux Herbert. That is a name. Fifth Earl of Carnarvon. Well, George studied at Eton College and Trinity College in Cambridge. He succeeded his father in the earldom in 1890. But Carnarvon loves motor cars and racing. And in 1903, he had a really terrible accident in which... He's not really recovering from his injuries, and so his doctor suggests that he start spending the winters in a warmer climate. And this is what brings him to Egypt. As we all know, we can't have the discovery of King Tut's tomb without Lord Carnarvon. In 1907, he takes on the sponsorship of the excavation of the nobles' tombs in Deir al Bare, near Thebes. And this is when, on the recommendation of another Egyptologist named Gaston Maspero, he hires Howard Carter to oversee the work. Seven years later, in 1914, Lord Carnarvon received the concession to dig in the Valley of the Kings, replacing, guess who? Theodore Davis, who has resigned his position. I mean, this is very important to know because Carter, having previously worked with Davis, he knew that King Tut existed. They had already found little pieces of his existence here and there, whether it was a piece of pottery or a cup or a scroll, the name was out there. And there is also an interesting legend that suggests that Carter knew where the tomb was all along and to use Carnarvon's money to dig elsewhere, making important discoveries along the way, but all the while keeping the Tut tomb in his back pocket and only, quote, discovering it after the Earl had threatened to pull funding. In any case, Carnarvon gives the important job of finding the tomb of Tutankhamun in this area to Howard Carter. Except World War I happens. Ah, <laughs> damn World <laughs> War I. When you least expect it. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, a small setback. So, there's an interruption in the expedition. And work does not begin again until 1917. By 1922... With little of significance having been found, and this is 100% true, which is why the legend exists, Lord Carnarvon decides that this will be the final year that he will fund the work. Miraculously, on November the 4th, 1922, Carter was able to send a telegram to Lord Carnarvon in England saying, quote, At last, we have made wonderful discovery in Valley. 
a magnificent tomb with seals intact. Recovered some for your arrival. Congratulations. Fuck yeah. We did it. Did the thing. He found the tomb that he probably knew about. <laughs> Maybe. It definitely seems like he knew about it. <laughs> it's, it's perfect if he did it that way. I... If you guys don't find something pretty big, I'm a cut funding. <laughs> oh, oh there it when you look at what I just had in my back pocket, uh, it's crazy. I also love that, according to Carter, it was a young boy who discovered the entrance to the tomb. And I just, part of me sees him paying that young boy quite a bit of extra money to pretend that he just found it out of nowhere. <laughs> When in fact, <laughs> he definitely paid him to, to say that he found it. For sure. Just to add, you know, to, to the wonderfulness of, I, I just, I don't know. This whole era is so crazy and fun, though. So, having been present at the official opening of the tomb on November 29th, Lord Carnarvon traveled back to England in December of 22. He returned in January of 23 to be present at the official opening of the inner burial chamber on the 16th of February, 1923. So it took them a while to get through to what is going to be the inner burial chamber and the official finding of the sarcophagus and, you know, that, that famous picture of the moment when they, they find out that everything is still in there which is amazing because there are so many burials, even up to this point, that were robbed years before Europeans ever set foot. Before the opening, however, Lord Carnarvon sold the exclusive newspaper rights to report the excavation to the Times of London. And while this helped finance the work, it created resentment from other newspapers and from the Egyptian press, who were also excluded. So... Not such a great idea on his part as far as how many people can I piss off all at once. I didn't know that was a thing you could do. Yeah, people still do it today. Giving photographs of, of newborn children, for example, like movie stars, you know, they'll be like, oh, People magazine gets the exclusive photographs of my child, for example. Interesting. Shouldn't have been a thing, especially for this. I will agree. For sure, for sure. For sure. And thus begins the curse of King Tutankhamun. It begins. On March 19th, 1923, Carnarvon suffered a severe mosquito bite that became infected by a razor cut. On the 5th of April, he died in the Continental Savoy Hotel in Cairo. Cause of death due to blood poisoning, progressing to pneumonia. That sucks. Yeah. And here's where we get Arthur Weigel a novelist, former Egyptologist, and journalist for the Daily Mail at the time of the tomb's opening. He is also considered to be a rival of Carter's. And while I did some investigation, I cannot find any significant reason why these two didn't like each other, although there is plenty of history between them. They did ab absolutely work together in different excavations with different people so like before this flinders petrie being one of them yeah so he is um he is a journalist for the daily mail and he's sent specifically to egypt to cover this because they believe he's going to be the best chance that they have of getting a really good story because he's an egyptologist and he's been there and he knows all these people and then imagine getting there and finding out well no you don't really get to report on it <laughs> sorry i'd be pretty pissed <laughs> Yeah, so having been so outraged that Carnarvon would give rights to cover such an important global event to just one newspaper, Weigel jumped at the chance to create a story to overshadow Carter and Carnarvon's important discovery, and that would be the curse of the king. It begins with him supposedly saying to another reporter that after Lord Carnarvon entered the tomb, I give him six weeks to live. Carnarvon died just six weeks and six days after he entered the tomb. Oh, called it. If he didn't. If you he think on like near the end of the sixth day, he was like, "Ooh, I really hope Ooh, like he's starting to sweat. Like, what if he doesn't die? <laughs> what if I'm wrong and he don't <laughs> die? What if I'm <laughs> off by a I week? I look like a fucking idiot. I could be off by a week. Damn it. 
Okay, so Weigel, of course, now jumps at the chance to extend that statement even further and starts claiming that the curse of King Tut is what killed him. Even though Weigel apparently did not believe in the curse himself, but it was a way for him and other newspapers to create a story where they didn't have one. Thus, hoisted upon their own petard. <laughs> also, Carter doesn't help things any by inadvertently getting involved in the curse when he teamed up with a magazine writer named Percy White in 1923. Carter and White wrote a semi-fictional magazine story called Tomb of the Bird, Death of the White Canary. And that tells of Carter's pet canary being swallowed by a cobra. In fact, Carter's canary was passed off to his assistant who cared for it until it passed of natural causes. Completely fabricated story for fun, but comes back to haunt Carter because now the newspapers have nothing else to print and they quickly get themselves detached to the ideas of both curses and cobras eating canaries and how the cobra is a is significant to a pharaoh. So it, it becomes a whole thing. Not helping any at all are a number of famous authors who also believe in the curse or even, you know, just famous people at the time. The biggest one really being Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, writer of Sherlock Holmes, in case anybody doesn't remember. I actually knew that name. That's like the one name you've said that I, I knew. <laughs> you don't read. You don't read. No, but other people do. And then they tell me and then they say, <laughs> oh, do you know who wrote Sherlock Holmes? I'm like, no. And then they hit me until I say, oh, it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so doyle told the press that carnarvon had been killed by quote elementals protective spirits living in the tomb i just okay got him uh, right got him <laughs> soon every death with even the slightest connection to the dig up to and including the sinking of the titanic which i will get to in a moment <laughs> was being blamed on the curse or a curse of a mummy while ignoring the fact that those at the very heart of the excavation live to be very old. Among the quote victims was the quote tabloid pleasing fate of Captain Richard Bethel. And this is actually a very sad story. And it, it's tabloid pleasing because it, it happened in exactly the way that someone would want to if they wanted to further an agenda of a curse. Right. Sure. Captain Richard Bethel was a member of the committee to the Egypt Exploration Society, and he did assist Howard Carter in the excavation of the tomb of King Tut. He was found smothered to death in his room at an elite gentleman's club. Like, no one was ever brought to justice for this. So that kind of also sucks. It remains a mystery. His father, Lord Westbury, committed suicide by jumping out of the bedroom window of his seventh floor apartment. However, he had a very long period of illness. And if you couple that with the fact that, yes, his, his son has died under, obviously he's either murdered or just mysterious death, you know, and having gone through World War I, he left a suicide note that read, quote, I really cannot stand any more horrors and hardly see what good I'm going to do here. So I am making my exit. People latched on to the I cannot stand any more horrors and immediately thought that that was the curse. Whereas rational people were like, okay, World War I was pretty fucking horrific. Nobody had ever been through anything like that before. And this guy, yeah. right? <laughs> that's kind of a, yeah. That's kind of an understatement. <laughs> right? I know. I, I'm I'm really I feel like yes, I sugarcoated that that statement even, right? But it, there's no no other way to put it. It's, no one's seen death and destruction like that. For people for people who don't know a lot about military stuff, World War 1 is what made a lot of countries go, "Hey, we should like do these rules of engagement things because nah. we're really just doing some awful things to each other. Yeah. Yeah, isn't warfare? World War, yeah, I was going to say, like, that was where mustard gas was just being chlorine, used. Chlorine and yeah. mustard gas, which aren't pretty things to deal no. with. And fire. Wasn't that and the fire. other? Yeah. And a I mean, lot of, and a lot of artillery flame shells. Flame. A lot of artillery. Running cavalrymen into gunfire, like machine gun fire. Because they were still using, like, tactics from, like, the last 200 years of, of gun warfare 
but then yeah. also having machine guns and artillery fire and this new technology that completely changed shit up. I'm a military buff, so I could get into it. But like half of the people were like, we're just going to do war the way we've been doing it for the last couple centuries. And there was a bunch of other people that went, mm, no. <laughs> it's a lot easier to get rid of a lot of people all at once just like this. Let's go with this. Yep. We're going to shell them from a mile away and then open a bunch of cans of gas and just let it take care of the problem itself. <laughs> the other the other part of this, too, a lot of, again, rational people were saying at the time that because of World War I being so horrific and so many lives lost and so many young lives lost, there was this need for closure that people didn't have and this wanting of being able to talk to the dead spiritualism and because of that it then became a whole like not disturbing the dead if you do you're gonna get it like this is what's gonna happen to you so let me talk about the titanic for just a minute boy yeah i'm curious about that didn't think i'd be talking about that today did you guys okay yeah that's a bit of a swerve yep so the titanic sank in 1912 for anybody that doesn't know that some people believe that there was a mummy priestess <laughs> That was responsible for the sinking of the ship. What? Yeah. Was her name Iceberg? Because I think I've heard that. <laughs> oh, Priestess <man>. Iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Isis, so I really start. That's why I was laughing really hard. But like, oh my god, yes, yes, Ice, Isis, the Iceberg. You know, slightly different. Yeah. Wow. Glad I could help. British Museum curator Ernest Wallace Budge who, by the way, was also an Egyptologist, uh, received so many public inquiries regarding the alleged cursed mummy that he had to write a flyer debunking the rumors that could be distributed to the public. <laughs> I think it's hysterical. Like, let me write this down for you so that you understand. Stop trying to talk to me at the museum. I have work to do. But I'm going to write this out for you, okay? It's kind of like today we would have sent a mass email out and been like, there's no fucking curse, you dumbass. Despite this, people apparently sent money to the museum so they could purchase flowers to lay at the feet of the dead priestess to placate her soul, quote. And the tale of the mummy that sank the Titanic continues to circulate to this day, which is why I'm talking about it. It's ridiculous. Bob Breyer, another uh, American Egyptologist, love him, love him. Uh, he did some fantastic work with King Tut, actually, and um, was one of the first people to really start talking about how he died and how he was probably murdered. So that was pretty cool. He explains the hoax in this way. And I'm just going to, it's a rather long quote, but it's Bob Breyer and he's fucking awesome. There's no other way for me to say this. The story was initiated early in the century by Douglas Murray and T.W. Stead, two Englishmen who claimed they knew of a mummy brought to England and placed in a drawing room of an acquaintance. The morning after the mummy arrived, everything breakable in the room was destroyed. The mummy was moved to several rooms in the house, each time with the same result. Soon after these supposed events, Murray and Stead visited the first Egyptian room of the British Museum where they saw the coffin lid, which is number 22542, of a priestess of Amun. They decided that the face in the lid was that of a tormented soul and told this to a newspaper, which were eager to print sensational stories, especially about mummies and curses, and soon the coffin lid became identified with the destructive mummy. So... You can go to the British Museum right now. You will find number 22542 in the Egyptian room on the second floor. Have at it. Yeah. But that mummy is not cursed and it's not even a fucking mummy. It is literally just the top of the sarcophagus. So not even close. No. But people actually wanted to believe that she was responsible for the sinking of the Titanic. And, there, and that also kind of generated another hoax story that there was an actual mummy on the Titanic and that like, no. That never happened. My favorite, though, and, and honestly, guys, this is it. This solves all the problems of all the deaths. Before you move before Okay, you move on. this is going to be great. This is going to be great. That sounds like a pretty awesome plot for, like, a, a B-list fucking horror movie. Just a mummy on the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we sure that it hasn't already been made? I mean... And then some 
some daring main character runs the Titanic into the iceberg to put it to rest at the bottom of the ocean. I'd watch it. I would watch the shit out of that. Uh, <laughs> this needs to happen now. We have we have some contacts. We need to we need to make some right? phone calls. Bernie Rayo. I know you're listening. <laughs> make it happen. I need this. Make it happen. Oh, also, that is called the unlucky mummy. In case anybody wants that, that's if you're if you ever see the unlucky mummy circulating around the internet, it's a hoax. It never happened. But guys, 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 here it is. Here is the real killer of all of them. Okay. It was Alistair Crowley. Bum bum bum. Really? Wait. Wait. I have some <laughs> questions. <laughs> Is is Aleister Crowley a mummy? Now I don't know many things, Kiki. <laughs> but what? You now have my attention. Oh, now I have it. Okay. Well, there's now a I second name I remember. I I know about in this that I've heard before. Mister Crowley. In his book, London's Curse: Murder, Black Magic, and Tutankhamun in the 1920s West End, Mark Bainon pretty sure that's how you say it that's how i'm saying it i don't fucking care he postulates that it was actually alistair crowley who went around killing all of these people because of his religion the lemma hold on to your butts holding he accuses crowley of being responsible for the deaths of the following raul loveday who died on february 16th 1923 he was an oxford undergraduate and was a follower of crowley's cult he died on the same day at the very hour of Carter's opening of King Tut's burial chamber. Apparently, after drinking the blood of a cat sacrificed in a Crowley ritual. That's a bit crazy. Is it? Is that, like, factually accurate? <laughs> I have no idea. Wait, we're not talking about facts here, okay? You're oh, just oh coming, my bad. You're, my bad. You're just my coming bad. down bad. the rabbit hole, okay? My bad, my bad. Prince Ali Kamal Fahimi Bey died on July 10th, 1923. The Egyptian prince was 23 years old and was shot dead by his French wife of six months, Marie Margot, in the Savoy Hotel. Shortly after, he was just photographed visiting the tomb. I mean, forget the fact that he had absolutely nothing to do with the exca excavation whatsoever. However, Mr. Benon says that Crowley and Marie had been lovers in Paris, and she agreed to kill him. For Crowley. Ooh. Aubrey Herbert died on September 23rd, 1923. Aubrey Herbert, the half brother of Lord Carnarvon, died of blood poisoning after a routine dental operation. Okay. That sucks. That just sucks. <laughs> He's leaving a lot of information out about Aubrey Herbert, by the way. He he had a ongoing medical issues and it was very it was very sad. He did he did die shortly after his brother now keep in mind he's a half brother so he just it was like one of those uh surgery didn't go that well uh fuck now he has blood poisoning and now he's dead fuck that should happen a lot unfortunately then of course we go into captain richard bethel who i just told you about bethel uh was said to have been in perfect health quote he was initially thought that he died of a heart attack but his symptoms uh, raised a suspicion that he was smothered to death while he was sleeping. And even to this day, it is said that he was most likely smothered to death. Now, Crowley had only recently returned to London and was often a guest at the same club. It's said that Crowley snuck into his room and smothered him to death. God Lord damn away. it, Crowley. You know, I just... <laughs> Wait, like, I'm not done. <laughs> for a guy, for a guy that was going around fucking everything that moved in the name of magic or whatever, like, <laughs> he mur he did... He must not have slept. Right? Because, god damn, where do you get the energy? I don't know, man. From the annals of the <laughs> dark magic. <laughs> Shit, you right. Do you mean anal? Yeah. Yes. That's <laughs> when it came to Crowley. That's where you get it from, right? Right. That's where you get uh, dark magic from? Sure. <laughs> uh, of course, then Lord Westbury, Bethel's father, he committed suicide, although Mr. Bainon has said that it's practically impossible for an elderly man to have climbed out of the window ledge. And he suggests that Crowley just pushed him off. Edgar Steele died in February of 1930, only four days after the death of Lord Westbury. He died of a stomach operation. <sighs> okay. Of course, he speculates that he was behind his death because he was in charge of handling the tomb artifacts at London's British Museum. And then, of course, we have Sir Wallace Budge. 
who I just mentioned. He died in 1934. We all know from what I just told you, he's the British Museum's Department of Egyptian and Assyrian Antiquities. He was found dead in his bed at the age of 77. A friend of Lord Carnarvon, he had been responsible for displaying the artifacts. Mr. Bainon says there's evidence that Budge and Crowley were associates on the London occult scene. Yeah. So, there you have it, guys. It's just all been, all this time, it's just been Crowley. The Literally, the only thing that I would say about this that makes any sense is that if Crowley was actually trying to do this, he was able to get off killing everybody with like minimal investigation because the curse was a thing. If the curse wasn't a thing, there might have been more investigation involved. That is a speculation. That is not the truth. The honest truth is that um, everyone who was very much involved in the excavation all lived to be well into their 60s and 70s with no complications. Except for Lord Carnarvon, he's really the only one, and, and that was just a fluke. But I did think that that was a fun little story to share with everybody, because it is just a story. By the way, that book has like a one-star rating on Amazon with people going, how are you getting away with saying that this is history? <laughs> but what are the chances that in Alistair Crowley's dark handlings of magic, he came in contact with the spirit of King Tutankhamun, who was like, exact my vengeance on these people. And he was like, yup. Except there was never any curse written in the tomb or anywhere around him. It did not exist. Just take that theory and throw it in the garbage. Mal, let me tell you about an Egyptian curse that's real. In 2020, <laughs> uh, you guys probably remember this story because we started finding a lot of mummies at Saqqara, which is a pretty important area in Egypt, if anybody doesn't know. That's also the, um, just for my uh, nerd friends out there, that's the name of the one guy in uh, Stargate SG-1. Thanks. Just, Fucking just saying. shut up. <laughs> Just saying, it's it's uh, one of my favorite shows. I know. Okay. I never watched it, so I don't know. Well, that's because you're a piece of shit. Whatever. At the time this article was written, there was 160 new mummies found, but there's now over 200 excavated. Salima Ikram, an Egyptologist at the American University in Cairo, sent Business Insider, this is where the article comes from, an email. And she said, quote, speaking of the curses, they generally state that if the tomb is entered by an impure person, in body or in intention, then may the council of the gods punish the trespasser and wring his or her neck like that of a goose. Now, the specific Saqqara curse that Ikram was quoting here was found in the tomb of the vizier Ankh Mahor, a pharaoh's official who lived more than 4,000 years ago during the 6th dynasty, and he was buried in a mastaba which is an above-ground tomb shaped like a rectangular box. Mastaba is also the Arabic word for table. Similar mastabas are built all over Egypt, including the most famous, technically the most famous one, which is the first successful pyramid, which is Zoser's Pyramid in Saqqara. And that is actually six mastabas of descending size, one on top of another to create that pyramid. And I probably talked about this at least one other time in an episode where we covered the mummy, which was the 1990s gothic horror. We covered the mummy with Brendan Fraser. And I like the fact that Imhotep has always been one of the names used. That is actually the architect of the pyramid at Saqqara for, King, uh, for the Pharaoh's Ozer. So he's a real person. The curse was meant to protect Ankh Mahor, roughly translating, warning that any trespasser, quote, might do against this my tomb the same shall be done to your property and it also warns of the vizier's knowledge of secret spells and magic and threatens to fill impure intruders with fear of seeing ghosts curses like this were meant to deter grave robbers ikram says and i agree with her wholeheartedly and this is another reason why i say that even if there was a curse at king tut's tomb it would have to be very similar to this one where it's all about the impure intent. So Carter, etc., they're going in there to discover things. They're not going in there to rob or steal, essentially. Those items wound up in museums for everyone to cherish and enjoy. Well, I'll say like 98% of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know about all of it. There's a couple stories about some people who had some of some of the things that they were they they took, you know, with them back to London, which which again just talked about, you know, the curse. But even so, 98% of the items are taken there. They're taken for the good of everyone. They the archaeologists would not be covered by that curse anyway, cuz they're not really going in there with ill intent necessarily. And then, of course, that's not to say that every archaeologist during this time period was a good guy because they fucking were not. There were some real pieces of shit out there. That's for another time. I'm excited to hear you bitch about archaeologist drama from like those times. <laughs> this motherfucker. <laughs> Let me, Let talk me about tell you about fucker. Charlie. OK, he first of all, rapist. <laughs> Woo! Starting off strong. <laughs> we, Belzoni comes to mind. Yeah, an Italian archaeo- Italian quote archaeologist who <laughs> spent most of his time just going around stealing shit. I believe, and I tried to, I actually tried to find this just for this episode because a lot of people don't know that the scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where Marion is kind of inundated with all these mummies, kind of you know coming down in onto her, and she just screams in absolute terror. That happened to an archaeologist and i believe it was actually belzone that he fell into a room full of dead bodies like that that were just sort of like stacked one upon another because he had claimed it was like mummy after mummy after mummy and the thing was this guy was like over six feet tall he's fucking huge and could barely fit into like small spaces anyway and then getting like inundated with all these dead bodies i know that the story is true i just can't remember if it's belzone or another archaeologist but FYI, yeah, that uh, Spielberg, well, was it Lawrence Kasdan, I believe, was the writer for that? Either way, they were definitely inspired by true events in archaeology for that particular scene. Well done. I'll have to go back and rewatch those movies. Oh, I love those movies so much. X never marks the spot, and then it does at the very end, which I thought was great. Well, in the third film, so we don't talk about the fourth one. It doesn't exist. Did you hear they might be making a fifth? No, they're already not hear it they're making it like it's a done deal it's, it's a happened. done deal i hope shia labeouf comes back he was i the back part fuck you <laughs> <laughs> fuck you so our musical guest today you guys might have remembered i mentioned this band back in october because they had a show at ortlieb's on halloween night with eyeball and my band is ugly <laughs> the ugly band <laughs> My band is ugly as their Instagram account. It's very funny. This is Lar Lane, and the song is called Chamomile. And they are out of Philly. They're freaking awesome. And I'll get the deets for you guys on Instagram, but they just found out that they're going to be opening for the Lemonheads in this area. I just cannot remember off the top of my head right now uh, what date it is, because I'm going to be making an Instagram post for them to let everybody else know exactly when that show is happening. But when we get back, we'll do some Spooky Squad news and um, shout outs or whatever the hell we're going to talk about. We sure learned a lot. We unwrapped a lot of things today. It was crazy. 
except for a mummy. We actually did not unwrap a mummy, thank God. I mean, you didn't. You're just complaining about how no, you had like no money. You got money for a fucking mummy, dude? It's it's really? not that hard to go find a corpse and <laughs> wrap them up and then unwrap them. Wow. JC, quick question. When was the last time you found a corpse? Real quick. <laughs> <laughs> just found a corpse. Uh, fair, fair point. Um, you can tell us all about it in the Resurrectionist episode that's going to be coming up really soon. All those techniques, you know, how to dig up bodies and steal them. Okay. Yeah. I'll definitely, yeah. 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 I don't. So make sure that, that you crime, yeah. <laughs> crimes. For sure. For sure. For sure. The um. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'm. Uh, you got me. Shh. Shh. Don't say anything else. Save the material. <laughs> On our Discord channel guys it's it's open you know it's been open for a long time but but we just added something called the donate bot pretty excited about this if you if you join through the donate bot on discord then you uh you can sign up for like two dollars a month and half that money is going to go directly to a charity that we're going to change up every month so kiki is raising money in december for the wolf sanctuary in pennsylvania to honor my dear friend Wolf, who passed away, God, quite a few years now. I can't even remember. It's been too long now. Seems like, It still seems like just yesterday, as far as I'm concerned. I missed my buddy. But he was a special effects artist. Um, he made vampire teeth at conventions, but he also did it professionally. He made uh, some of the teeth in Underworld, and he was also partially responsible for making the teeth that Sabretooth had in the first X-Men movie. So... He is really well loved and just a great guy. So in his honor, because wolves were his favorite, that is what I'll be raising money for. And if you sign up, the other dollar is just going to go directly to boosting our Discord server. And you also get a special moniker, which is a producer. You get into producers chat only and producers only voice chat as well. And you get a shout out on the cast if you choose to do that and help us out in December. The other big thing is that because Cord was not with us for the first part of Mission Spooky. You're welcome. And he's been a permanent member now. <laughs> yeah, thanks, JC. Thanks for you're, that. You're welcome, Cord. Any anytime I can fuck something up, you you let me know. I'll do it. And because our recording quality is nowhere good as it is now. We are going to be going back into our bonus episodes that involve states and places outside of the United States where we had listenership. We're going to be going back and re-recording those with new information. And the old one is going to get placed onto the dollar level tier on Patreon. The new material you will have to subscribe to on Spotify for $1.99 a month which will give you continued access to all of the old episodes as until we change them. But then you're going to get all the new bonus material as well. And yeah, so that's going to go into effect little by little. That means that I'm worth a dollar. Yes. Just so you know, I am worth one dollar. Yes. Well, <laughs> to us, you're worth way more than that. You're at least one dollar and seven cents. Wow, JC. Plus tax, huh? Well, yeah, sure. Why not? And speaking of our patrons, huge shout out to our new patrons. Skull Queen, my girl. Thank you so much for signing up. And uh, I'm, you know, I didn't get to ask the question of whether or not they wanted us to announce that they were helping us. But we have another very, very important patron supporter who just signed up. And it means the world to us that we have the support from I signed up like a while ago. I'm not Kiki. talking about you. I don't you. know who you're talking about. <laughs> God damn it. You ruined it, JC. I was trying to be all like heartfelt. Like, you know, it does seriously mean a lot to us that someone else who is very, very good at doing what they do. Has Mr. Bezos, back. everybody. Thank <laughs> yes, you. Yes, Mr. Bezos. <laughs> Jeff Bezos has finally signed up to the Patreon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Kiki's gonna murder us. I, you know, thank God yep. you're so far away from me right now. That's all like for the huge announcements that I have. Wait, you didn't actually say who signed up though. 
I said I don't think that they I think that they would rather remain anonymous. Oh, okay. Wow. It's just well, no, because I don't wanna that's you know <laughs> we don't we don't need to like throw that out there to be all like, yeah, we get support. No, that's let's just say someone else within the community is being super supportive of our podcast and we are highly appreciative and we love it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. We're gonna be working on developing a list of our ongoing donations like wolf sanctuary i think that's always going to be december because it's actually i forgot, I forgot to say it's wolf's birthday uh december the 5th so every december i always raise money for wolf sanctuary anyway so i think this is kind of a cool way to do it we can get any people to come on the discord sign up you get extras from us we really want to have a, a discord community where we can come on and you guys can sit in and listen to us chat about something once in a while like maybe it's you know some some topic and it maybe something even off topic from paranormal but just something fun and this is another way that we can do it we have a separate channel for those who are on the five dollar level for patreon we have a separate server just for them to do that but on our regular mission spooky server then we can say anybody who's a producer we can have a separate little get together where they can maybe come in and listen we do the talking you guys can do the listening but you also can use chat to ask us questions so that will be something that we do in the future. I think once we get up to about, if we get 10 people who decide to do the producer level on the Discord, then I feel like that's a good number of people to have into a, into a discussion or listening to us talk about bullshit or even doing movie watch nights or something like that, you know? Ooh, that'd be fun. Yeah. Why be... listen to me watch terrible movies and oh, bitch about them? Birdemic would have been great. <laughs> it probably would have been. Thank God we didn't fucking do hey, that. There's we, a sequel, buddy. I know. I know. And I I know that soon you guys are going to force me to watch it. And I hate it. I already hate that movie. Well, all right, then. I'm, as of a couple of days ago, officially fully vaccinated. So that would mean that, yeah, I'm s still recovering. I almost ended up in the hospital. But anyway, um, yeah. The likelihood of me and JC going on excursions now has just gone way up. Yay. Yes. Since I'm also refusing weekend overtime, so I have days open too. I am triple vaccinated, and my son was able to get his first vaccination. So I'm very excited. I feel, uh, as a parent, I just feel a little bit better about it. And he did super well. He had a very slight, like, little bit of a runny nose, but it's that's it. He's been fine. No worries. The government doesn't know where he is yet because they were putting chips in. You know, everybody knows this, JC. You know, what's crazy is they put chips in, but no salsa. And that's what really frustrates <laughs> me. Oh, my God. Where's the side of guacamole? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> I like the thing in Cord's mind. He's like, we're going to a graveyard just so I can fucking murder him there. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> Stick him right in the grave. Boom. Oh, don't fall in that hole, JC. I was going to say, JC, look at this big hole over here. Isn't this crazy? Oh, wow. That is a big hole. It's about me. <laughs> as, you hear, as you hear the pinging of a shovel off of a skull. Yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I told you I'd be the host. I told you. <laughs> Uh, last little bit of uh, of stuff here then before we get going. Oh shit, we're uh, still recording. <laughs> you guys, yeah, you guys um, voted on us to do the Rosicrucian Pyramids next. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I love it. Okay. Finally. Finally, I get I get my way. What were the options in the poll? The Rosic, you're, like you're making it seem like maybe there was just one option. No, it was they they did a very good job of um the vote was uh the Lazaretto station, the Doan Outlaws or the Rosicrucian Pyramid and they um Lazaretto came in at 18%, Doan was uh 24%, Rosicrucian 58%. So they really went for that. Man. They were like fuck yeah. Yeah, that was a decent amount of voting too. We had 33 listeners vote on that. I I meant to have the vote go longer, and I screwed up, and I sent it in. And they're like 16 hours, so that was a really short amount of time. So hey, thanks if you voted. Thank you very much, because you're gonna get a really cool little um, Pennsylvania pe peculiar Pennsylvania episode on the Rosicrucian, the Lazaretto Station. 
that was interesting because it was a quarantine station. Uh, the Don't Outlaws found out a lot more about these guys, and I definitely think that we could do a side mission of uh, true crime-ish side mission with those guys. Only I'd want the two of you in on that one because, holy shitballs, this is a very interesting story. Sick. So, all right. Taking us out once again is Philadelphia band Larlane with their song Chamomile. Please go follow them on Instagram and keep an eye on our socials, especially Instagram, for the date that they will be opening up for the Lemonheads. Stay spooky and don't die. But if you do, contact us. Via hieroglyph glyphic messages. Holy shit, JC. Do that again. What the fuck was that? Hieroglyphics. You said hieroglyphics, dude. Look, I never said I was a smart kid. Do it again, motherfucker. Uh, via hieroglyphic messages. Oh my god, thank you. Oh, oh.